Well, Johan, thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's great to be with you. Thanks very much, man. You must be super busy. I know you must have do a ton of these from everything I've seen you on recently, but particularly I saw you on Bill Maher recently. I thought that was amazing. Oh, thanks very much. I should apologize to your listeners because I have drunk enough caffeine today to kill a whole field of cows. <laughs> and I'm conscious that my weird Downton Abbey accent is incomprehensible to most Americans. So if I drink caffeine, just tell me to slow down. But yeah, I, I, really, I love doing Bill's show. I've done... I go on pretty regularly, so um, I really liked it. Yeah, I really like it. He's kind of a hero of mine. Tell me what anything you can about that show and what it's like being on there. I don't know much about that world, but I just think Bill's terrific for the way he is in the middle of everything and says, you know, he's definitely got the thing going where he can say whatever he wants to say and he doesn't seem to belong to anybody, and I just admire that so much. But what's it like just doing his show? One of the things I love about Real Time is that it's one of the few spaces in American – broadcasting where you can actually have a serious argument with people like if i think about the people i've been on with have been really random you know who have i been on the show with mark cuban from you know, shark tank uh james carville uh barry weiss from the new york times just really interesting people who you can have an argument with mm -hmm. and you can it's not just like five minutes where you're like screaming at each other for five minutes and then it's over you can have a kind of sustained conversation and um I agree with Bill on a lot of things. Don't agree with him on everything. Um, but it's it's just a fantastic show to do. I'm really privileged. To, I've, I must have done it six or seven times now. How do they I'm prepare for that panel thing? Like who's like, you know, everybody kind of knows some stuff they want to say, but how does that, how do they pre-produce that? Is it very organized on who's going to say what or when, or is it just a free for all like it appears sometimes? Well, they have a brilliant um, producer called Susan Bennett, who I love. She's one of the best producers I've worked with. And uh, so you know in advance what the topics are going to be, but you don't know what Bill's going to say. You don't know what the other people are going to say. So it's a pretty kind of, um, it's pretty free flowing. And to be honest, every time I've done it, you just random shit comes up where yeah. you're just like, oh, I, you know, it's not, it's definitely not scripted. You don't know. Oh, sure. Yeah. It's spontaneous. And it's, and it's actually live. It's, um, I think a lot of people don't realize that it's, you know, whatever you say goes to like 5 million people the minute you say it. So it's, um, it's a slightly daunting <laughs> feeling because you think, oh, you know, uh, if you screw it up, it's going <laughs> to yeah. be a problem. It kind of hinges on his ability be, to be able to moderate in that format so so yeah. amazingly. Is that is that the fe the feeling you get? Like he can he just is able to control that that well? It seems like it'd be such a nightmare when you get so many brilliant people up there together that all have different opinions. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I nearly the last time I was on, I nearly lost my temper. <laughs> I'm, I'm friends with Monica Lewinsky, and, uh, who I think is an amazing person. Anyone listening who hasn't seen her TED talk about shaming and bullying and how to overcome shaming and bullying, really recommend watching it. I think she's an amazing, really just brave person who could have just crawled into a corner and died and instead used this terrible experience she went through to work with kids who've been bullied, work with internet shaming. She's really a, uh, uh, just a really dignified, admirable person. She could have gone off and been like, you know, she could have made money cheapening herself, and she never did that. Um, and I was on with this woman who's an admirable person in other ways, April Ryan. She's um, a broadcaster, a White House correspondent for one of the leading African-American radio stations in the U.S. And I can't remember why Monica came up, but I was saying how much I admire her. And she was just, like, sneering at Monica and kind of slut-shaming her and, like, saying, oh, she provoked Bill Clinton. And you're like really 20 years on you're still fucking slut shaming monica Lewinsky, you know anyway i nearly lost my time and i thought this is going to be a bad look for me if i start raging at her so i i kind of reined it in a bit yeah, but, uh, that. but did, could you tell that uh, i was pissed yeah, yeah. off i think that's a weird one the monica Lewinsky thing anyway like if it was anywhere close to today anything like that happened it would, it would go down quite differently yeah it's well we've got one of the really moving things about me too i've known monica for a few years now one of the really moving things about me too is how it's taken 20, it's, it's exactly 20 years since Monica was picked up by the FBI and everything happened. And, um, you know, it's really moving to see it's taken 20 years, but people finally see it from her point of view, right? Yeah, a lot, you're starting to hear that more and more. I think that's, that's a good thing. It's, uh, yeah, it's been a, been a wild 20 years, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So she said on Twitter <laughs> the other day that uh, someone was telling me, I'm not looking at Twitter, but the, um, that she'd seen some, you know, uh, 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 something on about nostalgia for 1998. And like, I wish I could go back to 1998. She's like, 
yeah, I'm the one person in the world who really, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go back to 1998, right? Under any circumstances. So, yeah. That's funny. It's a, it, you know, how about this for a segue? A lot of things have changed in 20 years, especially, not especially, but pertinently to our discussion today, the way people think and look about depression. So let's get into that. Um, so i tell you something that's interesting to me is in, in this, in my lifetime, I'm, I'm a person, oh, let me start this way. You're somebody who has experienced depression and that's part of your story and narrative anyway, correct? Yeah. yeah. So I'm coming at this from a different point of view. I'm somebody who in no way really gets it, identifies or understands depression at all. It's something that's always mystified me that I've just not been able to really understand. I just think, you know, I'm, I'm the classic person who, when I was growing up, I had a girlfriend that was severely depressed when I was 22 or 20. And I just had the, just, I can't, I can't believe what a twit I must have been, just how horrible, because I understood it zero. I just thought, well, cheer up. There's no reason to be sad. This is dumb. You know, that's the way I've almost always approached stuff like that. So I've been, very interested in the topic for a long time. I do another podcast called the Bad Christian Podcast, and my co-host there, who's a good friend of mine, is just devastated um, with depression, and it's really has wound up affecting me. I know that sounds selfish, but it's affected me a ton over my over the last ten or twenty years, and especially in, in doing business and doing a podcast and running a business with him and everything. And um, and so I've been, I've just done a lot of thinking about it and always had a, a, a hard time understanding the way people talk about it, whether it's the person that suffers it or the academics or the books and everything about it. It's always just been a really, really puzzling thing. So when I heard your book, which I haven't gotten through yet, but I'm going to very interested in it. And I've heard a ton of media and stuff that you do and familiar with your previous book. I was just really thrilled about it. So I've really been interested in everything you've had to say about it. And you've articulated a lot of things that, um, I think or kind of suspect it or sound at least sound right to me. And so that's, that's basically my interest here. And I'm curious for you just to begin with, can you give some, can you give some initial insight into what it's like to be somebody who suffers from depression and then have to deal with people like me that don't get it? That's really interesting. I've not been, I've not been asked it quite that way before. Well, good, because I, I know you've been asked a million questions by a million smart people. <laughs> I think part of the problem with depression is that we've got these really bad metaphors for them, right? And often these very... Um, I think you, you... Matt, have you had moments in your life when you felt really unhappy? I mean, yeah, I've been sad. I mean, I've had bad things happen to me and been sad about them, you know, momentarily or or whatever. I mean, I'm relatively, a, I'm a really even kind of guy. It's just I'm I'm less emotionally affected across the board than most people, I would say. Have you have you experienced grief? Have you had someone you loved who died? My mom died uh, this past year. So I'm I'm sorry to hear and that. That's but, brand new, yeah. So you know that feeling of grief you had. Mm -hmm. I would say the best way I can describe depression is imagining that feeling of grief but without the object of having lost someone you, you love there's this really interesting thing that was discovered about depression in the 1970s right and it was so inconvenient it was kind of brushed under the brushed under the carpet um so in the 1970s the american psychological association the apa who were the main kind of psychology body in the u.s decided they were going to do something kind of simple they were just going to standardize how people diagnose depression. Because up to then, doctors had just been calling people depressed, using their own whatever they thought they should do, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a really simple thing. They drew up a list of 10 symptoms of depression. Kind of obvious stuff. Crying a lot, feeling life is pointless, that kind of thing, right? And they sent it out to doctors all over the United States. And they said, if your patients show more than 10 of these symptoms for more than two months, diagnose them as mentally ill, give them whatever's support you can right so they send this list of symptoms out all over the country but within a few months psychiatrists and doctors start to come back and go look we've got a bit of a problem here if we use this checklist and we just follow it the way you've done we're going to have to diagnose basically all grieving people in the u.s as mentally ill because mm -hmm. when you lose someone you love you cry a lot you you feel all these forms of distress right 
and and the APA were like, Jesus, that's not what we meant, right? <laughs> that's, that, that's not what we intended. So they created something they called the, that got called the grief loophole, right? Where they said, okay, use this checklist to diagnose depression unless someone they love has died in the last year, in which case it's actually a perfectly normal response, doesn't count, they're not mentally ill, mm-hmm. right? So doctors start using that. But that started to prompt people to ask a really awkward question, right? They start going, well, hang on, we're meant to tell people depression is just a brain disease, that you're just diagnosed with a checklist, except in this one unique situation where actually it's perfectly natural to feel this way. But why is someone you love dying the only situation in which this is a normal response? Why not if you've lost your job? Why not if you've lost your home? Why not if you're stuck in a shitty job you hate for the next 40 years, right? If you, once you admit that there is one thing where actually depression is a perfectly understandable human response, you have to admit there are loads of things where depression is a normal, understandable human response, right? And as Dr. Joanne Cassiatore, who's one of the leading experts on this, said to me, the system just isn't designed for that, right? Once you have to admit context and life circumstances, the the whole system isn't designed for that. You'd have to change the whole system, right, to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So the APA dealt with this embarrassing problem by getting rid of the grief loophole. Doesn't exist anymore. Now, if your child dies at 10 a.m. and you're still crying that night, you could be diagnosed as mentally ill that night. In fact, 9% of grieving parents are diagnosed as, as mentally ill and drugged in the first, first 48 hours after their child dies. And I think, yeah. and so the reason I think this relates to your question is, I don't think it's a coincidence that grief and depression have the same symptoms, right? I think what depression is, is grief for your own life not going the way it should, for your own needs not being met, right? Everyone watching your show knows They've got natural physical needs, right? You need food, you need water, you need shelter, you need clean air, all sorts of things. If I took any of them away from you, you'd be screwed really quickly, right? So there's equally strong evidence that human beings have natural psychological needs, right? You need to feel you belong. You need to feel your life has meaning. You need to feel that people see you and value you. And um, you need to feel you've got a future that makes sense. All sorts of things I go through in my book, Lost Connections. And Our culture is good at lots of things, but we've been getting less and less good at meeting these deeper underlying psychological needs. And I think partly what depression is, not entirely, there's lots of things going on, but part of what it is, is a kind of grief for your own life not being how it should, for your needs not being met. So I would say if you're trying to think about what depression is like and you've never experienced it, and to your credit, you want to understand that, think about that grief you felt for your mother and imagine that grief being applied to your own life, to feeling that, you know, when someone you love dies and it's recently anniversary of someone I love dying, you feel that terrible sense of that person's gone. You can't get them back. That, that this, it's a form of love, uh, love for the person who's gone. It's not a pathology. It's not a sickness, right? It's, a, it's actually a necessary human response. I think imagine that, but imagine feeling that was applied to your own life. Imagine feeling that you couldn't get back your own life, that you couldn't get your own needs met, that you didn't know how to do that. You didn't know how to get out of it. I think that's the closest I can get to trying to explain it. Does that does that help? A yeah, bit? it does. It, but it opens up all these other, you know, questions there. Like, uh, like for one, you know, it's it's it'd be bizarre to have that type of feeling and not know, which is so weird about people with depression, um, is they. Well, see, that brings up two questions. <laughs> one is they don't know why they're depressed, and then two, and and a, a lot of time the answer to that would be it's not because. A lot of time, people that are depressed, I've found they typically think it's not for any reason. It's just a, you know, brain chemistry thing. You know what it's I mean? Not, and I know that's at the heart of this whole thing, but that's where it gets pretty no, crazy. That's not, I don't think that is unusual. Actually, there's, um, as human beings, we think we know why we feel the way we do. Mm-hmm. Turns out we don't know why we feel the way we do at all, right? Not just for depressed people, everyone. There's a huge amount of psychological research that shows the explanations we think we have for our behavior are not true, right? So I'll give you a simple example of someone I interviewed, an amazing guy called Professor Tim Wilson, who wrote a book called Strangers to Ourselves about how human beings don't understand ourselves, right? And a simple, uh, really simple example, uh, it's a, uh, let me think if I get this experiment right, I might get some of the details of this wrong because I didn't write about it, but I'm pretty sure I'm getting the gist of it right. Um, so you get people to keep a detailed mood diary, not depressed people, just normal, non-depressed people, 
get to keep a detailed mood diary for ages, right? So every few hours you have to say how you feel. And you also have to note a load of other things like, did you have an argument with your girlfriend? What's the weather like? Are you hungry? And if people do that long enough, you can actually figure out what affects their moods, right? You can go, all right, well, you know, Matt is someone who feels like shit when he's had a row with his girlfriend and someone else feels terrible when they're hungry or it's rainy. Some people are affected by the weather, whatever, right? But then at the end of the experiment, you know what actually affects the person's mood. Then you say to them, what do you think affects your mood, Matt? Right? And you say, well, I think I feel good on days when it's sunny or whatever. Uh, And then you give your mood diary to a total stranger who has never met you, right? Don't know you, don't know anything about you. And you say to a total stranger after 10 minutes looking at your mood diary, what do you think affects Matt's moods? That total stranger is as likely to guess correctly what affects your moods as you are about yourself, right? I believe that. Human beings don't know what affects our moods. At, we, we infer, you can see this with children, right? I recently took one of my friends, a friend of mine um, died a few years ago. And I took his son to see the movie Coco, you know, the Pixar movie. <laughs> Have you seen it? It's amazing. My daughter loves and that and seen it. I didn't actually realize before I took him to see the film that it's a film about people who've died who are trying to contact people who are alive. And his son's only six. So I thought, oh, shit, I made a mistake here. But I said, do you want to go? And he said, no, no, I want to stay and watch it. But there were quite a few moments in the film which were really sad about death. And what's interesting is my friend's son kept saying, I'm scared right and they weren't scary moments they were they were sad moments and you could see he couldn't he was misreading his feeling of being sad as his a feeling of being scared right we all do that look at any child that they misread their emotions right but we think that we grow out of that as adults actually in fact as adults we we don't understand how we feel at all so actually i wouldn't say that depressed people are particularly unusual in not knowing why they feel that way most people don't know most of the reasons why they feel the way they do. We are constantly misreading. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things I used to say about depression is depression is when you feel terrible for no reason, right? But actually what I learned in the research for for Lost Connections is that's not true. Actually, there are nine causes of depression and anxiety for which there's scientific evidence. Two of them are biological, your genes and real changes in your brain, but most of them are factors in the way we live, right? Very specific factors in the way we live. But but for exactly the reasons we're talking about, often people don't know that's the reason why they feel terrible. So I'll give you a concrete example. We are one of the loneliest societies that has ever been, right? There's a study that asks Americans, how many close friends do you have who you could call on in a crisis? And when they started doing it years ago, the most common answer was five. Today, the most common answer is none, right? There are more people who have, imagine what life is like if you've got no one to turn to when things go wrong, right? And um, there's a lot of evidence. Professor John Cassiopo is the leading ex- was the leading expert in the world on loneliness. He was at the University of Chicago. I interviewed him a lot. Sadly, he actually died last week. It's a terrible loss. And, and he proved that depression causes loneliness, right? That in fact, being acutely lonely is as stressful for a human being as being punched in the face by a stranger. Um, and if you think about the, the, you know, why are we alive, Matt, right? One of the reasons you and I exist it's because our ancestors on the savannas of Africa were really good at one thing. They weren't bigger than the animals they took down. They weren't faster than the animals they took down. But they were much better at banding together in tribes and cooperating, right? Mm-hmm. Every instinct human beings have is to band together in tribes and cooperate. And if you think about the circumstances where we evolved, if you were separated from the tribe, you were depressed and anxious for a really good reason. You were about to die, right? Uh, so this is why we feel bad when we're separated from the group. We are the first humans ever to disband our tribes. And unsurprisingly, we feel terrible, right? But that's weird, though, because it's like that's a feedback loop. Like it seems like if it was evolutionarily built in to feel bad when you feel isolated, it would give you motivation to get back in the tribe. But it almost seems like the way you're saying it is when you get depressed, you and we know this, people isolate themselves. That's the, the part of the phenomenon that's particularly destructive, I suppose. So it's a complex relationship where what part of what depression is, certainly not the whole thing, is a signal to get back to the tribe, right? But there's a point at which if you are separated from the tribe for too long, you give up, right? Mm-hmm. And of course, you can see why there would be evolutionary bands. Professor Cassiopo talked about this really well. You see why there'd be evolutionary bands just to both. At first, you want to be like, get back to the tribe, get back to the tribe. It comes a point where you're like, 
I'm not going to get back to the tribe, right? Uh, it's over. Uh, of course, there are many other things going on. I'm slightly simplifying here. But, the, but what I was really interested in looking at is, well, what is the antidepressant for that cause of depression and anxiety, right? What, how do we deal with that? There's an amazing doctor here in, 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 in London called Sam Everington, who's one of the heroes of Lost Connections, who, who pioneered an alternative approach. So Dr. Everington is a doctor in a really poor part of East London. It's actually where I lived for a really long time. And Sam was just really uncomfortable because like me, he's not opposed to chemical antidepressants, but he could just see for most of his patients, they were not solving the underlying problem, right? They were giving a bit of relief to some people that has value. He decided to pioneer a different approach. So one day a, a, a patient came to him called Lisa Cunningham, who I got to know pretty well. Lisa had been shut away in her home with crippled, crippling depression and anxiety for seven years. And Sam said to Lisa, Okay, don't worry, I'm going to carry on giving you these drugs. I'm also going to try something else. I'm going to prescribe for you to take part in a group. There was an area behind the doctor's surgery. Can I swear on your podcast? Feel free. Yeah, there's an area behind the doctor's surgery that people call dog shit alley, which gives you a sense of what it was like, right? Sam said to Lisa, what we're going to do is we're going to turn dog shit alley into something beautiful. What I want you to do is to turn up twice a week, and with a group of other depressed and anxious people, I'll come and support you too. We're going to make something beautiful out of it. The first time they met the group, Lisa was literally physically sick with anxiety. She found it unbearable. But there were a lot of things going on. Firstly, was the group had something to talk about that wasn't how shit they felt, right? Because most of what we do for depressed people is we either drug them or we give them the opportunity to go and talk about their misery. This group had something to talk about was something completely different. They were going to learn gardening, right? right they on. started to put fingers in the soil. They started to learn the rhythms of the seasons, there's a lot of evidence that exposure to the natural world is a very powerful antidepressant. We can talk about that if you want. Um, but also they started to form a tribe, right? And they did what human beings do when we form tribes. They started to solve each other's problems. There was one guy on the program who was living on the bus, right? A public bus, sleeping on the bus. They were like, of course you're depressed if you're sleeping on the bus. They decided uh, they were gonna pressure the local authority to get him a house. They succeeded, it was the first time They'd done something for someone else in years. It made them feel much better. The way Lisa put it to me, as the flowers began to bloom, we began to bloom. There was a study in Norway that found a very similar program was more than twice as effective as chemical antidepressants. I think for kind of obvious reason. Mm -hmm. It's dealing with some of the reasons why they felt so bad in the first place. And everywhere I went in the world, researching lost connections from Sydney to San Francisco to Sao Paulo, what I saw was the, the strategies for dealing with depression and anxiety that were most effective were the ones that dealt with why people felt so bad in the first place. So people, I imagine, though, at this point, to, if they wanted to oversimplify what you're saying, I know that it would bother some people because it sounds like you're saying, look, look, quit with the antidepressants. Go plant a garden. Go make a friend, and you'll be better. That's that's the cure here. And the people that I, you know, you know, know, they reject that kind of thing usually pretty quickly, and they're more entrenched in the, uh, no, there's something actually wrong with my brain, and I need the pill, kind of thing like that. I, I'm sure you get a lot of that that pushback in that regard, though. Yeah. So, pretty much every scientist who's looked at this agrees. There are three kinds of cause of depression and anxiety. There are biological causes things like your genes, real brain changes. There are psychological causes, which are how you think about yourself. And there are social causes like the way we live together. They're all real and we need to deal with all three of mm -hmm. them. This isn't about pitting those three against each other. We've been told a really oversimplified story that it's just about your biology. Um, it's not, the biological factors are real, but there are these other factors playing out as well and we need to deal with all three. In terms of chemical, it remind me to come back to question about people saying, well, can I do that? Mm -hmm. But in terms of chemical antidepressants, I was quite surprised by the evidence on this, and I found this quite painful. Did you used very... to be on chemical antidepressants? Or so, I took, so I took chemical antidepressants for 13 years. I'd gone to my doctor when I was a teenager, and I'd explained that I had this feeling like pain was kind of leaking out of me. I couldn't understand it or control it. And my doctor said, told me an entirely biological story. He said, well, there's this chemical called serotonin in people's brains makes people feel good. Some people naturally lack it. You're clearly one of them. Uh, we'll just give you these drugs and you'll feel better. And I felt immediately better when I started taking the drugs. And for two months, I felt this huge boost. 
And then this feeling of pain started to bleed back through. So I went back to the doctor, said, well, I didn't give you a high enough dose, gave me a higher dose. Again, I felt better. Again, the sense of pain started to come back. And this kind of went on until I was taking the maximum possible dose for 13 years, at the end of which I still wow. felt like shit. And I'd also experienced an enormous number of side effects, like um, enormous weight gain, things like that. So uh, I wanted to really you know, understand what was going on. I want to understand why it was happening to so many other people. I mean, I'm 39 years old. Every year that I've been alive, depression and anxiety have increased, right, in the developed world. I want to understand what was going on. So I went on this big journey over 40,000 miles for the book. I interviewed the leading experts in the world on what causes depression and anxiety and what solves them. And um, in terms of chemical antidepressants, I think the, the evidence is, is, is really interesting. So, um, and it, my advice is certainly not just everyone should stop. And, you know, that, that's definitely uh, unequivocally, I say in the book, and I say every time I'm asked about this, you know, if for you, the benefits are outweighing the side effects, you should carry on taking them. Um, depression is generally one of the ways depression is most commonly measured is something called the Hamilton scale, right? I've always felt sorry for whoever Hamilton was that we only remember him by measuring how shit we feel. But anyway, so the Hamilton scale goes from one, which is where you would be dancing around in ecstasy or maybe on ecstasy to 51, where you would be acutely suicidal, right? And to give you a sense of what movement on the Hamilton scale looks like, if you improve your sleep patterns, you generally gain about six points on the Hamilton scale. And if you, uh, your sleep patterns get worse, like when you have a baby, you'll often lose six points on the Hamilton scale. On average, according to the leading expert at Harvard Medical School, chemical antidepressants give you a movement of 1.8 points on the Hamilton scale, right? <laughs> much. It's important to say 1.8 points is not nothing, right? If you're acutely suicidal, you can see how that might save your life. Mm -hmm. It's also important to say that's an average. So initially I got a lot more than that. Over time, I got a lot less than that. So, you know, it's, it's not like everyone will get 1.8 points. Um, but yeah, as you say, it's surprisingly small, right? There are some people who dispute those figures and say it's actually three points on the Hamilton scale. I was persuaded by the expert at Harvard Medical School, but you know, even three, but the upper end is three points, right? There are also some people who say it's more effective for people with severe depression than for people with moderate depression. And there's a big debate about that. But, the, the, but what that tells us, I think, is something that's kind of common sense and will fit with what most people listening and watching will know. Chemical antidepressants give some people some relief and therefore have some value, but they're not solving the problem for most of us, right? They're not enough on their own to solve the problem for most of us. We need a broader approach. This is about expanding the menu. It's not about taking anything off the menu. But one of the places that really helped me, it was one of the moments when this really fell into place for me help me think differently about this question. I went to interview a South African psychiatrist called um, Dr. Derek Summerfield. And Derek, just by coincidence, happened to be in Cambodia when chemical antidepressants were first introduced in that country. And um, <clears throat> the Cambodian doctors hadn't heard of these drugs, right? They didn't know what they were. So they asked Derek what they were and he explained. And they said to him, oh, we don't need it. We don't need antidepressants. We've already got antidepressants. And he said, what do you mean? He thought they were going to talk about some kind of, you know, herbal remedy yeah. or something. Instead, they told him a story. There was a farmer in their community who worked in the rice fields. And one day he stood on a landmine and got his leg blown off. So they gave him an artificial limb um, and he went back to work in the fields. But apparently it's incredibly painful to work underwater when you've had where you've got an artificial limb. I imagine it was pretty traumatic for obvious reasons. The guy starts to cry all day, didn't want to get out of bed, classic depression, right? So the doctor said, we gave him an antidepressant. Derek said, what was it? They went and sat with him. They listened to him. They realized that his pain made sense, that it wasn't some irrational inspiring. They figured if they bought him a cow, he could become a dairy farmer. He wouldn't be in this situation that was upsetting him so much. They bought him a cow. Uh, within a few weeks, his crying stopped. Within a month, his depression was gone. They said to Derek, so you see, doctor, that cow was an antidepressant, right? Now, if you've been raised to think about depression the way we have, that it's over, that it's entirely biological, sounds like a bad joke, right? I went to my doctor for an antidepressant. He gave me a cow. But what those Cambodian doctors knew intuitively is what the World Health Organization, the leading medical body in the world, has been trying to tell us for years. Your pain makes sense. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, you're not crazy, you're not a machine with broken parts, you're a human being with unmet needs, 
And what you need is support and practical help to deal with those deeper underlying causes of depression and anxiety. So partly what I'm trying to figure out in the book is what's the cow for the things that are making us feel so bad, right? Yeah, but th but that makes you have to isolate it down and give it these really, you know, you you know, small narrow causes like oh, it's the that's very that's very acute and easy to see maybe in in a situation like that or maybe even the guy sleeping on the bus, but typically it's a lot more complicated than that. Like the guy sleeping on the bus for instance, I'm sure it wasn't just he got evicted and went straight to the bus. I'm sure he had loads of problems that led to sleeping on the bus or whatever it is. And like you said before, people don't know what their problems are. I mean, so I don't know, you know, I'm not sure where, you know, exactly what we do about that because most people's problems are so complex. It, you know, I think in your in Lost Connections, it seems to be the thing that you're that you're describing is that our society and the way that we live as a whole needs to be looked at and addressed versus we're just going to go figure out what kind of cow everybody needs, right? So I think that the cow is like, I think you're totally right. And for most people, problems are more complex than they were for the specific farmer. I think what that, what I took from that is firstly, and this goes back to the individualism, like, um, You'll notice what those, far, what those doctors didn't say to that farmer is, hey, buddy, you've got to sort yourself out, right? You've got to pull yourself together, right? It's on you, mm -hmm. right, to fix this. What they saw is that he needed practical help to change his life. I think you're right that there are these complex factors that are playing out, and lots of them are quite challenging for me because I could see them playing out in my life. I'll give you a specific example, right, um, about one of the factors causing depression and anxiety, the nine that I talked about, but one of them – I, there were quite a few that I found challenging. This is one of the ones I found most challenging. So everyone listening to this show knows junk food has taken over our diets and made us physically sick, right? I say this as someone who basically ate a KFC for 10 years, right? I had this low point in my life once one, uh, just before Christmas in 2009, I went to my local KFC and I said my order, which is so disgusting, I won't even repeat it. And the guy behind the counter said, oh, Johan, I'm really glad you're here. Wait a minute. I was like, all right. And he went off and he came back with a massive Christmas card that the entire um, staff of this KFC had written to me. And in the middle, it said to our best customer. <laughs> and my heart sank. And then I actually thought this isn't even the chip fried chicken shop I come to the most. Right? Like, this is a really bad sign. But, um, but so we all know that fried chicken, you know, uh, junk food appeals to the part of us that evolved to need food, but it doesn't give you nutrients you need and actually makes you sick, right? What surprised me is a very similar thing has happened with our values. So for thousands of years, philosophers have said, if you think life is about how you look to other people and about money and status, you're going to feel like shit, right? It's not an exact quote from Confucius, but that's basically what he said, right? But weirdly, no one had actually scientifically investigated this until this amazing professor I got to know called Tim Kasser, who's in Illinois. Um, and he started researching this about 25 years ago. So... Professor Kasser showed that there are basically two kinds of motives that human beings have, right? And we've all got both, right? So, you know, I'm totally unmusical, but let's imagine you play the piano in the morning, right? If you play the piano in the morning because you love playing the piano and it gives you joy, that's it called an intrinsic motive to play the piano, right? You're not doing it to get anything out of it. You're just doing it because you love it. It gives you joy, right? Okay, now let's imagine you play the piano, I don't know, because your parents are really pressuring you to be like a piano maestro, or in a dive bar that you hate because you've got to make the rent, or I don't know, to impress a woman, maybe some piano fetishist, right? Mm -hmm. That would be an extrinsic reason to play the piano. You're not doing it for the joy of the experience, you're doing it to get something out of it, right? You're doing it one remove, right? We're all a mixture of intrinsic and extrinsic motives, but Professor Kasser showed a few really interesting things. The first is, the more you're driven by extrinsic motives, not by doing the thing that you think is valuable, but to get something out of it, how you look to other people, the more you will become depressed and anxious by quite a significant amount, right? It drives up depression and anxiety. And second thing he showed is as a society, as a culture, we have become much more driven by these extrinsic junk values. As a culture, we begin to, we've begun to think more and more that what matters in life is how you look to other people, how much money you have, how much status you have over other people. Think about even just simple things that you will have seen in your life. How many times have you gone to a music concert and noticed 
that people don't actually sit and listen to the music and get into the moment. They take out their phones and start Instagramming it and Facebooking it. What's that about? They're jolting themselves out of this moment when they're doing this thing that they love. They're hearing Rihanna or whatever. And they're going, no, I want to show this off to other people. I want everyone to know I'm at the yeah. Rihanna concert yeah. and they're Extrinsic, not. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So you can see how we've all been pushed towards these junk values. But so many people just think, well, that's just the way you live, right? I think about some, a couple I really love, right, who are related to me. Um, you know, they would and do work all day at jobs they don't like to buy shit they don't need. Mm -hmm. They get that shit that they've been primed by advertising to want. They show it off on Facebook and everyone goes, OMG, so jealous. Um, and they still feel like shit, right? And they're really puzzled because it's like, they wouldn't put it this way, but it's like, but I'm doing everything that I'm being told to do, right? I'm being told all my life, the way you make yourself happy is you work hard and buy shit. Um, I'm buying the shit, I still feel bad. And then they just think, well, I didn't buy the right thing. So they go and buy the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And they show all those things off on Facebook and display that. Mm -hmm. So they live in this purely extrinsic way. It's like a person whose diet is exclusively junk food. Yep. Their values are exclusively junk values. But because we've been in immersed in this culture where we think that's how you live, right? That's what life is, right? That's how you make yourself happy. Mm -hmm. We're baffled that we're not being made to feel better. But what's so interesting is Professor Cassidy did all this research where you just get people to meet a couple of times a week and talk about what they actually think is important in life and how you can overcome these extrinsic values. It's like a kind of AA for junk values, right? And just meeting a couple of times a week for a few months led to a really significant fall in people's junk values, a big increase in their intrinsic values, uh, and, and we know that that correlates with a fall in depression. So w these, these insights are just below the surface. It's one of the really weird things about this book, right? Before the book came out, to be honest, part of me thought, what I'm saying is really obvious, right? I've written a book. I mean, there's lots of interesting stuff that people wouldn't know. But the core of it is saying to people, if you're depressed and anxious, it's probably because you're lonely, your work is meaningless to you. You're insecure. I mean, if we stop anyone in the street and say, do you think those things increase loneliness? It's going to be like, yeah. duh, right? If you look back at the Hamilton scale, like even something just like extrinsic over social media, Instagram, if you get too deep into that junk food analogy, which I totally agree with, that's got to be worth X amount on the Hamilton scale. It's not enough to take you from a 40 to a 10. It's not that, but it, it could be enough to where it starts a little bit of a spiral for you. And all these things kind of contribute. It seems like to me... Uh, what you're saying that makes a lot of sense is it's obviously a bunch of factors together. That's why, you know, all the shape of society plus your exercise habits and your sleep habits and some of your serotonin levels, all that together is going to equal something. And you've got to attack it on all fronts. That's a really good way of putting it. And what was so weird to me was, so before the book came out, I was like, this is all kind of obvious what I'm saying, right? Uh, like there's lots of interesting facts and stories and individual stories and crazy stuff I learned. But the core of it is kind of, and I thought, actually people are just going to, people are just going to go, well, this is kind of obvious. What was so striking to me is most interviews I've done, people have introduced me saying, Johan Hari has written this really controversial new book with this radical new way of thinking. And I'm like, really? Like what's surprising to me is how many people have been so shocked by what I'm saying. Why do you and how think many that is? I think why, why I tried to think back is how shocking I found it, right? When I started learning this stuff. And I think part of it is we've been told this. We've been told two stories about depression. We've been told this heavily biological story. Oh, it's just about the serotonin in your brain or whatever. And is that because of, I mean, it's not conspiratorial, just like the drug companies pushing the drugs. It's not that, is it? Well, it's, no, it's not a conspiracy that McDonald's wants you to eat Big Macs, right? I mean, it's just, that's not a conspiracy. That's just McDonald's is a for-profit company that sells Big Macs. And in the same way, it's not a conspiracy theory to say Big Pharma want us to buy their drugs. I mean, any head of any Big Pharma company that, said anything otherwise would be fired immediately and replaced with someone who said we do want people to buy their drugs. So it's, not, it's partly big pharma. I don't, think, I don't think that's most of what's going on actually. It'll come to the second story in a minute. But the, the look, it's kind of shocking. The, 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 the leading expert at Princeton University, Professor Andrew Skull, 
says it is, this is his phrase, it is deeply misleading and unscientific to say depression is just caused by low serotonin. One of the leading experts in Britain, Dr. David Healy, said to me, um, you can't even say that the idea that depression is just caused by low serotonin has been discredited because it was never credited. There was never a time when half of the scientists in the field believed that. The reason we were sold this story that it's just about a chemical imbalance is because that was the story that worked best for the drug company PRs, right? Because that implies the drugs just restore a natural balance to your brain. They don't. As Professor Joanna Moncrief said to me here in London, um, they don't create, they don't create, restore a natural state, they create an unnatural state. Now, some people benefit from that unnatural state, to be sure, but it's not just restoring right. a natural it's not, balance. It's not that you just take serotonin, they're not serotonin pills. That's not what you're yeah. taking. Yeah. It's, 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 we, we were sold a very simplistic story about it. So I think part of what's going on, why we were told this, look, think about Lisa Cunningham, that woman who is prescribed to take part in the gardening program, right? There's a $10 billion industry in telling Lisa that she's depressed because she's got a chemical imbalance in her brain and she needs to drug herself. There is a $0 billion industry in saying, you're depressed because you're really lonely and disconnected from the natural world and actually you'll benefit from a gardening program, right? Yeah, plus who wants to hear their doctor tell them, I think, you know, they don't want to hear stuff that's not medical in nature. If you go to the doctor, or, you know, psychiatrist, you are seeking a, a medical thing. Like that. You By the time you go into that office, you've already got it in your head that there's something simple or medical or wrong with me. And so, you, you know, you, that's easy to confirm once you're down that road. Yeah, and you know, for many years, I wrote, you know, I wrote a lot arguing that depression is a chemical imbalance. That's just what's going on here. That this is just biological. And the thing about it is, how do I put it? If you've got a story about your pain, even if that story isn't working very well for you, it helps you to think about it, right? It's like if you think about your pain as like a wild animal. Once you've got a story, it's like putting a leash on that wild animal, right? At least you know where it is, right? And, and when your story is threatened or you suddenly realize, oh, actually, this isn't true. Certainly for me, this was really challenging, right? This was really threatening to me um, and disturbing, you know, because you feel like, oh, shit, the wild animal's been taken off its leash, right? But the reason why I stayed with this is because when you um, – if you don't have an accurate map, you can't find your way through the territory, right? And actually what I realized is when you, when you begin to understand this problem differently, it opens up a different set of solutions. So I'll tell you about the other cause of depression. I have to, unfortunately, I have to go in five minutes, but the, no problem. The, I'll tell you about another cause of depression and anxiety, the, the one that I found by far hardest to learn about for the book um and made me realize why i had stayed with this chemical imbalance story for so long even though i'm not an idiot i knew that if it was just a thing in our brains why would it be rising so much right <laughs> i mean that doesn't make sense so i learned it from this guy called dr vincent feliti and i want to tell you his story and for a minute for a couple of minutes it's going to sound like i'm talking about a whole other subject you can think what what why is he telling me this but stick with me because it led to an incredible breakthrough in depression right so in the mid 1980s this guy dr vincent feliti in san diego I got to know well um, later, obviously, was given a job. So there was a massive and rising problem with obesity in California at the time, as there still is. And Kaiser Permanente, who were one of the main medical providers in, in not-for-profit medical providers in California, were just really freaked out because they're like, look, we've got this huge problem with obesity. What are we going to do, right? Nothing they were trying, like giving people nutritional advice was working. So they gave Vincent a quite big budget and said, look, just figure out what the hell we can do, right? Do blue skies research. So Vincent goes off and he starts working with 350 extremely obese people, people who weighed more than 400 pounds. And one day he had this seemingly stupid, simple idea. He was like, what would happen if they literally just stopped eating, right? And we gave them nutritional supplements and we monitored them medically. Would they just burn through the fat stores in their body and get down to a normal weight? So obviously with like super intense medical supervision, they started doing this. And the crazy thing is, in one sense, it worked. So I'll give you an example of a woman I'm going to call Susan to protect her medical confidentiality. Susan had been over 400 pounds. She got down to 138 pounds, right? She just didn't eat, right? They give her loads of medical support. And then one day, something happened that no one expects. People are like celebrating, oh my God, you've saved Susan's life. It's amazing. And one day, uh, something happened that no one expected. She just freaked out 
and started obsessively eating and couldn't stop. Right? And quite soon she was back to a really dangerous weight. So Vincent calls her in and he's like, Susan, what happened? And she's like, I don't know. I don't know. She's really ashamed. And he said, okay, tell me about the day when you cracked. What happened that day? She's like, I don't know. I don't know. And he said, well, could, could, did anything happen? And something had happened that day that hadn't happened to her ever. A man had hit on her, right? And it really freaked her out. It didn't happen to her when she was obese for obvious reasons. And she just went that day and started obsessively eating. And he's like, oh, that's interesting. Vincent started asking her, when did you put on weight? It was when she was 10. He said, well, did anything happen when you were 10 that well, didn't happen when you were seven or when you were 15? And she looked down and said, well, yeah, that's when my grandfather started to rape me. Vincent started to interview everyone in the program. He discovered that 55% of them had started to put on their extreme weight in the wake of being sexually abused. Obviously, that's a much higher figure than the wider population in terms of sexual abuse. He's like, well, what's going on here? He started to realize this thing that looks like an irrational pathology, obesity, was actually performing a really important function. It was protecting them from sexual attention. The way um, Susan put it was, overweight is overlooked, and that's what I need to be. But Vincent, this is quite a small group, 350 people. Vincent decided to do much bigger research. He got a load of funding from the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. Every single person who came for medical care in San Diego for an entire year, whatever they came in for, headaches, migraines, broken legs, schizophrenia, anything, was given two questionnaires. The first asked, did any of these bad things happen to you when you were a kid? Things like sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, that kind of thing. And then it asked, have you had any of these problems as an adult? Things like obesity, um, addiction, and then at the last minute they added depression and suicide attempts, right? When they added up the figures, the results were crazy, right? For every category of childhood trauma you experienced, you were radically more likely to become depressed. If you'd had six of those categories, you were 3,100% more likely to have attempted suicide as an adult, like off the scale, right? And I think one of the reasons why I found this really difficult to look into and to absorb was because when I was a child, I had experienced, my, my mother had been very unwell, my dad had been in a different country, and I had experienced some very extreme acts from an adult in my life sorry to hear that no thank you and I, I think one of the reasons why i really liked the chemical imbalance theory is that it made that okay well that doesn't have any power over you that's not playing out in your life now and actually i remember the first time i saw vincent in san diego feeling this terrible anger towards him and like really he's a really wonderful man right but my every instant i had was like fuck you, right? I remember going to the beach afterwards and just raging into the sea, right, about him. And I think that's... I think that's, it feels like it's your fault then or related to something that's unchangeable in the past or something like that. Exactly. That's a really good way of putting it. And one of the reasons why I stayed with this is because of the next thing that Vincent discovered. So he did all this research and the next stage was so interesting. So all these people are given these questionnaires saying, did you experience childhood trauma, Right. The next time they came to their doctor, the doctor was told to say to them, given a little kind of script they had to learn, the doctor said, actually what you instinctively said, which is really moving, the doctor had to say, I see that when you were a child, you were sexually abused or whatever it was. I'm really sorry that happened. That should never have happened to you. Would you like to talk about it? And a significant minority said, thank you, but I don't want to talk about it. But most people did want to talk about it. The average conversation lasted five minutes. Uh, at the end of which, I think, I forget the figure, but about half of them were told, I can refer you on to therapy if you like, right? And they want to see the results. What's fascinating is just that five minute conversation where an authority figure said, I'm really sorry that shouldn't have happened. That alone led to a really significant fall in depression and anxiety. People who were referred on to a therapist had an even bigger fall. And I think that goes to exactly what you intuitively knew, Matt. It's about shame, right? What that does is it gives people a chance to release shame. And we know that shame poisons people. There's a, a guy in Florida called Professor James Pennebaker who's done amazing research on this. We know, for example, during the AIDS crisis, openly gay men die on average two years later than closeted gay men, even when they got health care at the same time. If you live your life in shame, it will poison you, it will destroy you. Giving people ways to release their shame um, helps them. In, and actually it was incredibly moving. An old woman who was in her 80s who'd been sexually abused wrote to one of the doctors and said, um, 
thank you for asking. I thought I was going to die and no one would ever know. Mm-hmm. And, and see how that would, what a psychological relief that would be for that woman, right? And to be told this thing that happened so long before that would have had such a profound effect in her life was not her fault and shouldn't have happened. So to me, this is part of a, again, the reason why I mentioned that in relation to so many of the other things I write about in my book, Lost Connections, is when you understand the causes differently, that opens up a very different set of solutions. So think about that woman in her 80s. Her doctor could easily have said, well, you're depressed. There's just a chemical imbalance in your brain. It's just serotonin. You know, then she wouldn't have got to that deeper cause. She wouldn't right. have got to that release of shame, right? It's not that it's untrue to say there's things going on in your brain when you become depressed. It's something that precipitates it, you know, often or multiple things. And it, that's, what, that's what's so hard is the, the brain chemistry thing is ultimately true. And there's tons of ways that that, that can precipitate that. So that's the problem because it's not to say it's not true that there's something wrong with your brain when you're depressed. There is, but how did it get that way? Of course, but it's like saying, I mean, the brain causes do make things worse, but stretch marks don't cause obesity, right? Right. Obesity causes stretch marks. In the same way, you can look at the changes in the brain and go, oh, well, this person's brain is different. Therefore, that change caused it. But actually, often, not always, the direction of causation is the other way, Right. It's actually that, that your brain changes as you become depressed. Now, some of those changes make it harder to get out of the depression, but they were not the initial cause. The initial cause is in the wider world. Well, this is why this guy who I was talking about, the expert on loneliness, Professor John Cassiopo, talked about social neuroscience. You've got to understand the way the brain changes by understanding the way you live that then causes those brain changes. I'm afraid I have to go in a second, yep, Matt. I got the, it. I get told off in my, uh, by my publisher if I don't say at the end of every interview. I always feel like an, a terrible advertising person for I was going to give you the plugs you need if that's what's coming. <laughs> so <laughs> and to find out any more information about the book, they can find out what a big range of people have said about the book, from Hillary Clinton to Elton John to Tucker Carlson to Russell Brand to Ariana Huffington, can go to www.thelostconnections.com. If they go to the site, they can take a a quiz to see how much they know about the real causes of depression and anxiety. They can uh, watch videos about interesting things. They can listen to audio. Lots of the people we've talked about. Um, what else can they do? They can find out where to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I had this funny experience recently. I was doing an interview at the end. They were like, what's your Facebook? What's your Instagram? And then they said, what's your Snapchat? And I was like, I'm a 39 year old man, yeah. right? <laughs> Only 39 year old men on Snapchat. You should be very suspicious. All right. But, <laughs> but, uh, so anyway, I've really enjoyed talking to you, Matt. I've really, this has been great. Thank you for your time, Johan. I enjoyed it very much. Cheers. Really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Talk to you again soon. Great. Cheers, Matt.